Welcome to another episode of Wire Wheels Privacy Rollup, a weekly recap of newsworthy privacy updates from our CPO, Rick Buck. How are you doing today, Rick? Hi, Janine. How are you? I'm doing excellent. That's great. Looks like there's a lot going on, as usual. Um, but um, as one of the topics I'd like to cover today is really about data breaches. And, um, you know, public, we're hearing all types of news about data breaches on a regular basis now. And um, one of the most high profile breaches in recent weeks has been solar winds. And it sounds like the Associated Press is reporting that the breach affected nine government agencies and almost a hundred private companies. This is an example of why there are calls um, for a comprehensive data protection strategy in America. Tell us a little bit more of what's happening in that space. Yeah, you know, solar winds is the latest. Um, uh, the numbers that you're giving, are, I think, are numbers people have, have heard on the news, but uh, the real breadth and depth of that uh, debacle uh, are still unknown to the general public, uh, but it was massive. Um, and data breaches happen time and time again. Data breaches um, cost companies money, cost companies reputation, uh, cost companies valuation. More importantly, they cost the people whose data it belongs to um, all kinds of trouble, identity theft and uh, money stolen out of their bank accounts and money spent on their credit cards. Um, and, um, um, you know, un unfortunately, it's become, to, you know, to the point where um, you hear about a data breach on the news and you're like, oh, yeah, another data breach, right? Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, the long and the short of it is, is that... Um, in many ways, the vectors for eliminating potential for data breaches uh, could be significantly reduced um, if companies spent more time, maybe not spending more time, if companies um, really buckled down and went the extra mile on, uh, on running data security programs. Mm -hmm. To say that most major companies and many of the companies that have been hacked don't run comprehensive security programs is a misnomer. I, I wouldn't imply that at all. I'm right. sure all of those companies are probably doing most of the right things. Right. Um, but many companies don't. Many companies don't um, understand the need for investing in the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I, I think part of the problem is that... Um, is that it's too easy sometimes uh, to break in. And more importantly, um, once uh, a system has been hacked, um, if data is not protected correctly, it's vulnerable. And, and that's where we have big problems. Right. Um, I was reading uh, recently uh, an article in Forbes uh, by a gentleman named Nicholas DuPont uh, who writes about this. Um, he talks about this concept of the zero trust model uh, mm -hmm. from an encryption point of view. And um, the zero trust model is essentially uh, uh, that um, uh, every entity, regardless of their size, shape, whatever program they have, um, should not be trusted. So when, you're, when somebody is attempting to get into your, into your system, uh, mm -hmm. whether known or unknown, they should not be trusted. Right. Um, the source of the data should not be trusted. Uh, the network should not be trusted. Uh, the data that you're getting from them should not be trusted. The server shouldn't be trusted. Mm. Um, um, and that um, if all access is cut off to the data and all of the data is encrypted in a way that even if it's exposed, um, it's not vulnerable, um, then it takes, uh, it takes, you know, it changes the denominator, if you will, of the equation of people being able to hack into right. the system. Um, and this mindset of zero trust security um, really provides a layer of security um, that, um, that, that, um, that eliminates a lot of the vulnerability for systems. Um, and um, the irony is that encryption in many other um, security protocols are already in place to, um, to prevent those kinds of things. Some wow. companies do a good job at deploying those strategies. Some mm -hmm. companies do a good enough job in deploying those strategies. Some right. companies don't do a good job at all. Right. Um, and the, I guess the question is, why aren't they being used? Um, and I think that part of the problem is they're not being used for two reasons. One of which is 
I think it's a simple, you know, it, it's a budget issue. How much does it cost to do this? What's our ROI on this? We're doing things good enough. You know, we're unlikely to be hacked. Um, you know, who's going to come after us? We're just a this, we're just a that. Mm -hmm. um, and yet those are the companies that are the most vulnerable. Right. Um, and I think that part and parcel, the other part of it is that we don't have any comprehensive laws that mandate um, that that type of um, protection happen, right? Right. Um, um, we are starting to see, see state laws that look a lot like GDPR. GDPR talks very specifically about protecting data and encrypting data. Um, California is, is talking about it now. Virginia is talking about it now. Many of the bills that we have discussed in previous uh, updates um, all uh, uh, speak to uh, the way in which data should be uh, stored and protected and encrypted. Mm -hmm. um, but there isn't a single you know, national governing uh, um, framework for people to follow, right? And um, we're probably, because we, we, we lack a universal standard, um, because there is no coordinated effort between the states and the federal government, mm -hmm. um, um, I think um, uh, um, I think by doing that thing raises the table stakes. Um, and uh, if people are forced, force is the wrong choice of words. If people um, uh, know that it's a regulation and they have to comply with it, uh, mm -hmm. people, companies will step up uh, and, and, and take advantage and, 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 and map to that and, and, um, right. and have better security protocols. Um, you know, we have things like HIPAA. HIPAA talks very specifically about security protocols um, mm -hmm. um, in protecting health information, but it's only talking about health information, right? right. GLB talks about it from a business sense of view. COPA talks about it from a child, children's data point of view. Right. Um, but I think we're probably at the point now, um, and, and uh, the argument is made in this article, um, that we, you know, I, I think having a comprehensive federal law um, mm -hmm. that resembles GDPR, um, at least in terms of uh, making specific recommendations about security protocols, mm -hmm. um, and then either having that be a preemptive law or a law that's harmonized with individual state laws mm -hmm. um, really sets the standard for how companies should be running their security protocols, assuming that it's written correctly. Right. Um, um, and that hopefully that makes a big difference um, in, um, uh, in, in, in companies being vulnerable. You know, when you, when you, uh, when you hear about, uh, you know, people whose uh, cars were stolen out of their driveway. Mm -hmm. and, you know, more often than not, the common denominator there was my car was unlocked and I left the keys in the car, right? So right. whose car are they going to steal in a parking lot, right? Right. The car that's unlocked <laughs> with the keys in, in the glove box, right? Right. Um, I don't know how many people still do that, but uh, but it seems like a, a meaningful metaphor. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, um, uh, you know, I think the time has come. Um, I think, you know, we're getting a lot more pressure from the privacy side, from the security mm -hmm. side. Uh, from the international community, um, so that um, that there should be real, you know, formal standards. Um, I don't think it's government's job to get in the way of companies running their business. Right? They shouldn't be a bottleneck in the way that they that they present this. Um, but I think it's a really important protection, certainly uh, from the point of view of uh, of a U.S. citizen's point of view. You know, the government's job is to protect its citizens, and certainly protecting. Uh, their identity and protecting their personal data, I, I think would fall into that category. Yes. Um, it'll be really interesting to see again, as, as I've said in the past, what the federal landscape looks like for privacy and data security laws in, in the near future. Yeah, I'm definitely, um, definitely watching that as well, uh, because, I, you know, I would agree when you look at Europe and what's being done there, then you have to ask how quickly um, we'll see that in the U.S. as well. Yep. And, um, you know, as we have discussed in weeks um, past, there's a lot of activity at the state level, but, um, you know, I, I think there's still a long way to go. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. And, um, you know, across the states themselves. So, yep. all right. So, um I also hear that on the European front, um, there are new SECs um, that have emerged that are here now. Um, some call it, some are calling it the new era for international transfers. <laughs> so, you know, do tell, tell me, tell the audience what's happening there. Yeah, we'll, we'll raise the flag, shoot off the confetti guns. Uh, the new standard contractual clauses are here. Um, 
in some respects, it's much ado about nothing. In some respects, it's, it is a big deal. Um, so uh, last week on, on Friday, the European Commission approved and adopted the new version of the SECs. Um, uh, the SECs, and I'll go into a little bit more detail in a second, you know, certainly talk about how data can be transferred outside of, uh, of Europe. Um, the effective date uh, will be, um, uh, there's an 18 month window from June 7th. So uh, that was uh, yesterday, an 18 month mm -hmm. window from June 7th for companies to update all of their standard contractual clauses uh, with partners that, that they have them with. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so there's that. Let me talk just a little bit. I'm assuming that everybody knows what standard contractual clauses are, mm -hmm. uh, but just as a quick recap, Sure. Um, GDPR says uh, in, in simple language um, that if you are transferring data out of Europe, out of the EU, um, it can only go to countries that have adequate data protection laws. And if your country does not have adequate data protection laws, there are a couple provisions by which you can comply um, with that adequacy requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, one of which is um, a very comprehensive program, mostly used for transferring data between uh, you know, intercompany transfers, but a, but a program called Binding Corporate Rules. Very comprehensive, uh, takes a while to, uh, to, to get certified, uh, but, uh, you know, in many cases, people would look at that as the gold star of adequacy uh, beyond uh, having adequate data protection laws. Um, the second way in which you can um, uh, honor that adequacy requirement is to add standard contractual clauses languages language to your contracts um, with vendors that are um, processing personal data on your behalf um, and for intercompany transfers across co country borders. Um, and then the third way, um, which is no longer valid, um, is the Privacy Shield program, uh, which uh, was uh, predeceased uh, by uh, its, its older sibling, uh, Safe Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll talk a little bit more that, about that in a second. Okay. So over the course of time, uh, the SECs have been updated. Uh, so initially in 2001, then in 2004, again in 2010, um, and uh, most recently um, uh, taking into consideration, you know, things like the Snowden story and the recent decisions in the Shrems 2 case, um, the new language uh, is trying to be a lot more aligned with GDPR um, and a lot more aligned with um, uh, the findings and the rulings as a result of SHREMS. Um, the new um, SECs, um, like the old SECs, um, are still, um, uh, so companies will still be required to look at data transfers on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. uh, there is um, a, a, a concept of reasonable security that needs to be put uh, on, on the data, depending on what kind of data it is it's being transferred. Um, they talk a lot about reasonable security and, uh, um, and what um, um, additional security protocols might need, need to be added uh, when transferring data. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of the, one of the criticisms of the new language is that there isn't uh, uh, specific and clear language about, um, uh, 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 about what additional security protocols actually mean. Right. Um, but uh, but much like the old ver uh, version of the SECs, there still is that concept. Okay. Um, one of the things that they've really, I think, done well with the SECs is uh, taking this, what they're referring to as a modular approach to the SECs. Mm -hmm. um, before, um, SECs were meant uh, controller to controller, controller to processor, data controller, the person who is responsible for owning and collecting and deciding what happens to that data, the data processor, somebody who's doing something with that data mm -hmm. on behalf of, of the controller, right? Sure. Um, the new SECs now contemplate four different models, right? So one is a controller to pro controller, which was previously covered. Uh, another is a controller to a processor, which again was uh, previously uh, uh, covered. Mm -hmm. uh, but now there are EU processors to non-EU sub-processors. Wow. Um, and EU processors to, e, uh, to non-EU controllers. I know that gets a little geeky, uh, <laughs> lot, but they're really trying to drill down into very specific use cases right. uh, so the data is protected uh, in, in an assortment. Um, um, 
that's probably uh, the, the, the biggest uh, difference uh, in the new SECs. Um, we have a, uh, a blog posted on our, on our website that goes into full detail about the new SECs. Uh, and I would encourage people to go there and read that. Um, I would say um, that um, in terms of next steps, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have an 18 month window, I would start uh, looking, uh, it, it, you know, if SECs are a part of your, your, uh, of your company story for, for meeting adequacy requirements, mm -hmm. um, you know, look at the SECs now, uh, look what the new language says, uh, put a schedule together, uh, you know, really get a clear understanding of which vendors you already have and which intercompany SECs you already have in place. Uh, where those gaps are and then who needs to be updated and uh, uh, and start to get that together now because 18 months seems like a long time but that that'll sneak up on companies um, really quickly. Um, the million dollar question is what does this mean for the privacy shield program everybody wants to know that I wish I knew the answer. Um, you know certainly um, I would say you know if, uh, if you listen to the press and the news this is a really high priority for the U.S. government President mm -hmm. Biden himself has said this is a priority for them, for him. Uh, you know, the, uh, they're meeting uh, in Europe this week uh, uh, at the summit. Um, this uh, apparently is, is an agenda item. Um, people have been talking on the European side and on the American side for almost a year now about uh, finding consensus on what good language means uh, uh, for reinitiating a privacy shield program. Um, uh, will we see a privacy shield program reenacted? My prediction is yes. Mm -hmm. um, when will we see this happen? It's anybody's guess. I don't see it happening anytime soon. Right. Um, but, um, uh, but, but I think all that is in motion. So, uh, you know, general takeaways for now. Um, if, if SECs, again, are part of your story, um, uh, start thinking about how you're going to put a plan together to upgrade them, um, what you need to do differently to comply. Um, and, um, um, and, uh, you'll be in good standing if you get this done earlier, uh, than rather than waiting, uh, for 18 months to pull it all together. So, right. Well, and the other thing that I'll say to our audience is stay tuned, um, for new episodes, uh, you know, yeah. definitely of, um, uh, Rick's privacy roll up because we'll keep you informed on yeah. that. All well, right. and also, you know, I, I mean, uh, you know, shameless plug for wire wheel, but this is exactly the kind of thing that we help our clients work through. And um, so uh, certainly don't be shy about reaching out to us, uh, nor will we be shy about reaching out to you and, and trying to help out as you're, as you're uh, trying to accomplish these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, well, what I'd like to do is to thank our viewers again for tuning into Wirewheel's weekly um, privacy roll up. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us at marketing at wirewheel.io. And um, you'll also be able to find us in the link in the description um, below. And I also want to thank you, Rick, for um, you know, taking the time to bring us up to speed once again of all of the changes that are happening in weeks, uh, over a week's period of time. Janine, thanks. It's always a pleasure. And thanks to everybody uh, for listening. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>